Hello, welcome to Citizens for Global Solutions Minnesota. I'm Katia. Citizens for Global Solutions Minnesota is a nonprofit organization based in the state of Minnesota in the United States. Every third Thursday of every month, we host one of our online projects. Today, especially, we will discuss Eswatini, the killing of the human rights lawyer and the regime of oppression. This event is free and open to everyone. If you want to learn more about CGS Minnesota work, please visit our website at www.globalsolutionsmn.org and follow us on Twitter and Facebook pages. Our Facebook page is Global Solutions MN and our Twitter is at CGS underline MN. Our YouTube channel is CGS MN. Today we are hosting Hadar Harris, a human rights attorney and nonprofit leader with a passion for working with and on behalf of students. She's executive director of Student Press Law Center. Prior to, join, to joining Student Press Law Center, she served as the executive director of the Northern California Innocence Project. For 13 years, Harris was executive director of the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law at American University Washington College of Law, where she worked on projects in more than 25 countries focused on domestic implementation of international norms, gender equality, the human rights of persons with disability, and the implementation of UN human rights treaty law. Earlier in her career, Harris serves as, served as executive director of the Congressional Human Rights Caucus, a bipartisan legislative service organization of the US House of Representatives under the leadership of the late Congressman Tom Lantos, the Democratic from California. Harris holds a bachelor degree in political science from Brown University and a Juris Doctor from the University of California, Los Angeles. Hadar, you are very welcome to uh, Citizens for Global Solutions and the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. Um, Katya and I have a long history and yet we haven't actually met up with each other until today. Um, and that history actually has to do with Tulani Maseko, the human rights attorney um, from Swaziland who was murdered very brutally just a few weeks ago. We're gonna talk about him, we're gonna talk about that case, but as we get started, I'm very aware that not a lot of people know a lot about Swaziland. From the beginning, what do we even call it? Swaziland, Eswatini? Right, we'll talk about why people call it both of those names um, or either of those names and how that came about to be. But I will, um, I will kind of go back and forth and then tell you where I come down on what I'm going to call it a little bit later as we talk. Um, I'm gonna share my screen just for a second because I threw a few slides together um, pretty quickly, I must say. So if there are big mistakes in it, you know, sorry. Um, Whoops, sorry. And Zoom is always quite difficult because you try to make it happen smoothly, but then you have the toolbar on the top of it. It screws the whole thing up, so I'm sorry. We'll start here. There we go. You can see it, it's good? Yes. Great. So let's give a little bit of um, context here to the conversation. Where is Eswatini? This is all Southern Africa. You can see, you can see my cursor, right? Here's South Africa. And this little tiny area of land is the entire kingdom of Swaziland. Um, it is about the size, a little bit larger than Connecticut. And it is completely landlocked and it is bordered by South Africa and by Mozambique. 
important to know that it has extremely close ties with South Africa and, and close economic ties with South Africa. Um, it has about 1.2 million people in the entire country. It's landmarked, as I said, and it has a long colonial history. The Boers were there, the British were there. We won't go through the whole history of you know, colonial impacts in the region, but suffice it to say that in 1968, um, Swaziland became an independent country. The current king, assumed power in 1986. It's important to understand what it's like in the country. A majority of the people in the country live in rural areas. There's a very high poverty rate, a very high prevalence rate of HIV. Um, and the king is the king. He is the last absolute monarch in Africa and he rules with a tight fist. He controls while there are houses of parliament and there is a judiciary, those branches of government are completely controlled by the king. There are no political parties. Um, and if you look at the Freedom House, Freedom in the World at Index, they rank 17 out of 100, um, down from 19 last year. So the situation is, um, is pretty grim there for people who are um, wanting to live in a, a free society um, and um, with political and, and civil rights. Um, before I get to those slides, um, the I got involved in, in understanding anything about Swaziland because I met um, a, a young lawyer whose name is Tulani Maseko, who came to American University when I was there um, uh, as the executive director of the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law. And he was a Humphrey Fellow, um, which is a fellowship that the State Department runs or that is run through the International Institute for Education um, that brings mid-career professionals to universities, including the University of Minnesota, um, um, to study for a year. And at WCL, we hosted um, law fellows from around the world. And I was fortunate enough to be asked to be Tulani's faculty host. And so um, we got to know each other pretty well. Um, and, you know, I knew absolutely nothing about Swaziland. I'm gonna stop sharing just for a second. Um, I knew nothing about it. Um, and, because I was his host, he educated me. I learned quite a bit about Swaziland. And we spent a lot of time together. We would go out to lunch and he would tell me not just about his country, but about the very real dangers that he was facing as a human rights attorney who was quite focused on bringing a multi-party rule to, um, to Swaziland and who, looked very, very, very clearly to the examples of Nelson Mandela and to um, the stories of Martin Luther King and was focused on learning about constitutional law while he was in residence with us. Um, I remember we went out for lunch um, one day and he was kind of laying out his manifesto for what he wanted to have happen in the country when he returned, recognizing that to even think about these things was extraordinarily risky. Um, but he was a, a, a man of great discipline, but also, um, and, and of intellect and of vision, and also a man of great humor and of deep commitment. He had a very easy smile. And, um, despite knowing the dangers that he was that that he was in and that he would be in when he went home um, he was very methodical about building his network of people and supporters not just in Washington DC but all around the world and that became really important as I tell you the rest of the story he was in residence with us in 2010 and 2011 and after um, graduating, he went back to Swaziland. The, um, 
he went back and he, um, you know, he opened his law practice up again and he took on cases um, representing people in all kinds of walks of life and also ensuring that he was um, pointing out some of the hypocrisies within the government. In 2014, he published a, um, an editorial in The Nation magazine, um, which is a, uh, an independent magazine in Swaziland um, that was critical of the judiciary. It was an article about the misuse of government resources, a car that one of the, um, 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 I'll get back to your comment in just a second, William, um, because it's a it's a good comment. Um, there was a misuse of a of a of a vehicle by one of the justices on the on the court, and they wrote an article kind of calling it out. And because of that article, and because of its implicit criticism, not just of the judges, but really of the entire system of government, which was controlled by the king, he and Becky Mahubu, the editor of The Nation, were arrested um, and they were thrown in jail. And, and um, as a result of that, they were sentenced to two years in prison on the basis of this article that had been printed. They were charged with contempt of court. And for Tulani, who was such a deep believer in the law and of using the law, um, you know, the, the trial was just a, a complete sham. So um, together with a variety of um, other organizations that we were able to bring together to um, raise awareness of Tulani's case and Becky's case, um, we launched a, a campaign to try to free them because it was very, very clear that um, they were being charged with, you know, that they they were accused of political crimes, right? And they had been convicted because of um, their efforts to kind of bring a dissenting voice to the country. The country was very repressive, even at that point. Um, I was able to travel to Swaziland um, to observe Tulani's trial. Um, and we were able to bring together a coalition of organizations. We produced a video, which I'll show you in just a few minutes. I don't want to show it yet. Um, that 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 spoke to their cause, but actually was Tulani's own words. He had written a defense that he was going to deliver in court, and they did not allow him to actually speak in his own defense. So we were able to get a copy of what he had written and we produced this video as part of the campaign to try to free him. Um, I was able to travel to Swaziland um, to observe one of the appeals at the Supreme Court and my colleagues from RFK Human Rights and representing the ABA Center for Human Rights showed up and um, we, we didn't actually know if we would be let into the country. And then we didn't know if we would be let out of the country. Um, at the time, my children were very little. So I said, you know, whatever happens, I've got a week of childcare and I need to get home after that. Um, which is funny and speaks to the privilege that we have here and obviously is not at all funny in the real context of what was happening there. We were able to go, we were able to observe the trial there were representatives from South Africa, including a very prominent jurist. Um, people from the International Commission of Jurists were there. Um, human rights defenders from other parts of the of Africa were there. Um, there was a there was a lot of attention in this country that often doesn't get a lot of attention. Swaziland is completely. Um, it does have several large industries that have business there. Coca-Cola has a bottling plant there. Um, I don't know if it's a bottling plant or if it was, it, I think it's a bottling plant there. Kellogg's now actually has a great deal of business there. But again, remember the people aren't benefiting from the businesses that have investments in Swaziland. And the commerce is all subject to um, a trade, trade deal through Southern Africa. 
So the situation, the economic situation of Swaziland is really dependent on the states around. And the um, and, and we tried kind of at the time to advocate so that even more pressure and more attention was being placed on the Swazi government, but they really didn't respond to any kinds of pressure. Tulani and Becky were kept in jail for well over a year. Part of that time was in solitary confinement um, uh, for Tulani. And um, ultimately, he and Becky were released just months before they would have been released because of their sentence, saying that the Supreme Court had made a mistake and that they were released. Um, obviously, the whole thing was orchestrated by the monarchy and by the government um, to try to kind of suppress their voices of dissent. Tulani continued his work, and I will tell you that one of the reasons that I call the country Swaziland and not Eswatini is that in 2018, on the 50th anniversary of the independence of the country, King Mswati III, who is the king, um, unilaterally declared that he was changing the name of the country from Swaziland, which sounded in his mind too much like Switzerland, there was too much confusion, to Eswatini, which is an indigenous name. It means the land of the Swazis, right? Lots of people don't have a problem with it being called Eswatini, but Tulani took a case and sued the king for not following the constitutional principles that, or the constitutional process that would have changed the name correctly. So at the time of his death, he was actually in the process of suing the king over the name of the country. And so in Tulani's honor, I call it Swaziland instead of Eswatini. Um, it should be noted that in 2021, there were um, very significant protests in the country. This is a big deal because again, this is a, an absolute monarchy and the people are very poor, but the king has security forces which have tamped down on any kind of dissent. Remember, there are no political parties, although in, um, um, in the, I think in the 1980s actually, um, a, a labor union political party started called Pudemo, which still exists today and which has become a force within the country and yet is not legally allowed to be a political party. Um, in May of 2021, there were pro-democracy and anti-monarchy uh, protests that broke out all th through the country. The king clamped down um, and as, as people will report and has been well documented, there was a massacre of around a hundred people who were killed while they were peacefully protesting. Um, and over a thousand people were rounded up and arrested um, as a result of these protests. But as a result of the protests and the unrest that really shook the country for the first time in a very long time, um, there was supposed to, the, the regional bodies intervened and said that they were going to start a constructive dialogue um, between stakeholders within the country and the government, meaning the monarchy, to talk about kind of a negotiated resolution. Tulani was a uh, first and foremost, very committed to nonviolent change in the country and became the chair of what he founded, something called the Multi-Stakeholders Forum. And that was just what it sounded like, bringing together stakeholders from all through the country to try to represent them and to work in an engaged way to create a democracy within the country in a peaceful negotiated way. Um, Tulani worked all across the region. Um, and again, as I said, he, he made networks you know, for himself all across the world. Um, in fact, when he was released from prison, he went and spoke at the Oslo Freedom Forum, which is a very prominent conference of, freedom, of, of human rights defenders. The year that he was in prison, his wife, Tane, went and represented him and actually gave the speech that he had written that he would have given had he been there. 
It is in many ways a classic story of human rights defenders who are oppressed and who are whose voices are tried to be tamped down. Um, but Tulani did not let that happen and his wide network of friends did not let that happen. And he really um, tried to elevate the story of what was happening in Swaziland um, in every way that he possibly could. On Saturday night, um, I believe it was January 28th, um, I got a text message um, that told me that Tulani had been murdered. Um, he was in his house, his family home with his wife and their two children, beautiful children. Um, and he was um, assassinated by gunshots through the window of their home. Um, brutal, 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 um, in front of the family, in front of his wife. Um, and um, his murder sent shockwaves not just through Swaziland, but through the whole region. Because the same week, two other prominent human rights defenders, one in Cameroon and one in Rwanda, were also murdered. But Tulani's death um, definitely shook lawyers and human rights defenders within Eswatini um, to the point where many people left the country very quickly because they did not feel that they were any longer safe. He is a very prominent figure within, you know, as the chairperson of the multi-stakeholder forum and very well connected and a, a real leader um, um, in the movement to be so boldly and brutally assassinated um, sent a very clear message. And that message came just a few hours after the King had made a statement in essence, threatening pro-democracy protesters saying something to the effect of, you know, don't shed your tears if there are mercenaries here um, and people are dying. Just a couple of hours before um, Tulani was murdered. His death has not only been a death for Swaziland, his death has been something that has shaken human rights defenders around the world. Last week, I think it was last week or the week before, I happened to be at a um, convening of human rights defenders at the National Endowment for Democracy here in Washington. People from all over the world, the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Association was there. Um, as well as an, um, uh, senior people from the State Department. And in every panel at every um, stage where people were talking about various dangers, Tulani was mentioned and his legacy very much um, has lived on. At this point, um, what's next? for Swaziland, what's next for Eswatini? And nobody really knows. Um, certainly there is a, a, a very real concern for human rights defenders and pro-democracy activists within the country. Um, as I said, many people have fled to South Africa or to other places, and many people who are here and have spoken out cannot go home at this point. Um, it's a very scary time. At the same time, just the week after Tulani was murdered, um, uh, the foreign ministry of Ru the foreign minister of Russia visited Swaziland, met with senior officials there, and committed to more defensive, you know, more military help, more defense help. Um, as a colleague of mine said, you know, the the military in Swaziland has never fought a war. They've never fought an external war outside of the country. The only reason that there is a military in Swaziland is to keep the people down. But, you know, as they say, you know, Tulani has planted many, many seeds. And one of the tensions right now is to try to really promote this engaged dialogue that the, the, that South Africa is supposed to be brokering through SADC and through regional bodies, but has not been a priority for them and certainly isn't a priority for the king. You have a young population who are getting 
really fed up and certainly radicalized. And there is a, you know, big, I don't know if it's a split, but there's certainly a tension between those people who believe in dialogue the way that Tulani did and those people who feel like um, using force would be um, appropriate at this point. So there's a lot of tension there. Um, there are ways forward, right? Through this dialogue process, there are definitely ways forward. But at this point, one of the most important things in my view is that there be a full, impartial, independent investigation into Tulani's murder and that there be accountability for what happened. If this goes back to the king, then that accountability needs to go all the way back to the king. Um, but it's very difficult um, given autopsies that have been conducted, evidence that has already disappeared um, and how you can conduct that kind of independent investigation at this point. It should be noted that um, upon his murder, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights made a statement about Tulani's death. Um, all major human rights organizations around the world, whether it's Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, BDOSH, um, uh, regional bodies, um, everybody made many, many different um, statements calling for accountability. The US government, however, has not done a great job. Um, the first message that came out from the US embassy in Eswatini was to express their condolences to Tanale and the family about the death of their, the tragic death of Tulani Maseko, prominent human rights attorney. That's not the kind of message that needs to come from the State Department. They need to condemn his, his assassination. They need to call for an investigation. They need to be much more forthcoming in crit criticizing what's happening in the country. I would expect that as a citizen of the United States, and I would want our government to, um, to very forcefully condemn what's happened. It took a couple days for that to happen. Eventually it did, um, after there was, you know, I'm happy to say we helped to really criticize and bring to the attention of folks in the State Department. The State Department spokesperson actually issued a full statement, um, but it took several days and that message is not unheard by the authorities in Swaziland when the US is slow to react in that way. Happily, many other places have reacted very strongly. So I'm gonna leave it there, but I do want to just go back for one second to share screen, to show you a few photos of when we were um, in the court in, in Swaziland for Tulani's trial, but then also to play for you just for a moment, the um, video that we produced with Tulani's own words so that you can see him, you can hear his, his words, and then we can take some questions or discussion if you'd like. Does that work? Great, now let's hope that the technology actually works. That would be great. So let me just move to the next page. Let me try to move to the next page. There we go. So these pictures are on one day of his trial, he wore traditional clothing as kind of a, a chief's clothing to make a point to the court. Here, I was showing Tulani the video that you're about to see. Um, this is his wife, Tanele, and their, their first son, who was quite small at the time. And this is really one of my favorite and now very poignant pictures of um, Tulani with his huge smile. Um, and, and you can see the generosity of spirit just there. So with that, I'm going to hopefully be able to play this video. Uh, but I think that I needed to hold on. I need to make sure that you can hear it. So I'm going to have to go back and share it again. Oops, share sound. And here we go.
defense is that I'm not in contempt of court. But that the people of Swaziland are treated with contempt. I'm disgusted in this regard. The people of Swaziland have a right to determine and shape their destiny. If truth be told, this trial is about the prosecution and persecution of the aspirations of the people of this land. To determine their own destiny democratically and freely. When freedom is taken away, it becomes the onerous and supreme duty of man to reclaim it from the oppressor. For giving up freedom is tantamount to giving away man's right to dignity. One can have no dignity without his or her freedom. Without our freedom, we are a people without a soul. I am willing to pay the severest penalty, even if it means spending more days or even more years in jail. It is well with my soul. I accept the penalty with a clean and clear conscience that I did no wrong. Human yes. rights are inherent, inalienable, indivisible, and inviolable. This is clearly not, not the case. It's it. it is our respectful For contention that the issue here is not and has never been to the court. The issue is the, the abuse of the courts to silence dissenting voices in order to suppress aspirations for democratic change. The people are yearning for freedom, democracy, and justice. Suppressing ideas never succeeds in making them go away. Even if brutal force, arrests, and other forms of suppression are used to silence dissent, history shows that penalties do not deter men and women when their conscience is aroused. The path to freedom goes through prison. The triumph of justice over evil is inevitable. Nothing this court can do will shake me from my commitment to simple truth. truth. Justice. 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 So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much for, um, for telling us about um, your experience with Tulani and uh, telling us about the regime in uh, Swaziland. Um, some of you know um, that um, Lenny and I met in uh, 2010. Um, I was with him in the same program, uh, the Humphrey Fellowship. And um, we were classmates, classmates in the UC Davis in California. And that's how we met. And that's how we found so many things in common, even if we were living in a world apart. And um, he was, um, all. I think all the classmates could see how, uh, he, see his integrity and uh, his love for law and justice. And um, I never imagined that he, uh, you know, his, his life would take that turn uh, but as uh, Hadar uh, told you, uh, his prison brought us together in that campaign to free him. And watching this video um, made me remember those almost two years um, of campaign. It, it's uh, really impressive. So for I think for us, um, that's that's uh, heartbreaking um, to see that his work and his um, fight for justice uh, ended that way and uh, caused his assassination. And um, as a citizen of the United States, I do too want that um, to see our government to recognize that this was assassination. And I hope that we can see justice happening no matter what. Uh, I, I also wanted to say that I have been in contact with his wife and um, 
she was invited to to participate and speak and um, she accepted the invitation but I think it's just too too soon and uh, she's not well and she apologized but she couldn't be here but uh, she was very happy to know that Adar was going to be here she loves you so very much uh, I feel like when um, uh, Tulani was killed, a piece of each one of, was killed too. Uh, I think not only because he was our friend, but uh, because he was a human rights lawyer and defender. And if every one of us have rights here in the United States or anywhere in the world, it's because somebody before us was brave to fight for justice and to have justice. Uh, otherwise, would be still living in the barbarian times in the, in the, the dark. Uh, so I think we we owe so much to 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 Tulani. We would like to hear from uh, the audience if there are questions. Can, can I, while you're thinking about your questions, a couple of things that I forgot, you know, we were talking about accountability and an, you know, an independent investigation and accountability. Um, and that can take a lot of different forms. And I think, you know, as you're thinking of questions, um, you know, one of the things that that I talked a little bit about are the economic ties that the king has and that the kingdom has in South Africa and in the economic region. Um, you know, calling for sanctions under the Global Magnitsky Act is really important and figuring out and, and there are people working on this. Um, you know, the King has, has close ties in the United States, children that study here, and, you know, people like to come visit. Um, and making sure that both our State Department is consistent in the messaging that it sends to the King about what is unacceptable, right? Political assassination is unacceptable. Tulani was very much on track to be the first democratic president of Swaziland I have no doubt in my mind that that would have been his role and that is why they killed him. But it is up to our government to ensure that there is accountability for everything that the US government is involved in, but certainly also to push the South Africans to use all of the leverage that they have, which is quite a bit. And the African Union and the various organs um, regionally to put pressure as well. Um, I think it's really important that we're clear about the different kinds of, um, uh, of ways that accountability can work. Um, and there are lots of different levers that can be, that can be um, pulled, pushed. I don't, I don't know what the, to pull a lever, push it, whatever. Used, used, um, that would be the word. So, okay, I gave some time, so. We do have a question from Gail, Gail? Sorry, yeah, um, I, sorry, I, I joined a few minutes late. I had a, an errand that ran over longer than, I don't know if you gave any background regarding how the king got into power, um, why it's the last um, absolute monarchy of Swaziland. And I also noticed in the documentary that you just showed um, there was somebody with a big picture of Robert Kennedy behind her. And I'm wondering if there, there's some organization linked with him. Is he, is it an international human rights organization? Yeah, so that's the, that's the first, the first answer. That was Carrie Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy's daughter, who runs an organization called RFK Human Rights. And so, so they were one of the partners in developing this short video that um, that we just showed you. 
Um, so Carrie was there with a picture of her father behind her. Um, the ABA Center for Human Rights and the American University Washington College of Law Center for Human Rights, the three organizations came together to make that video. Um, in terms of, um, in terms of um, how the king came to power, it was through a family power struggle um, to succeed his father. Um, and he came to power when he was very, very young. I believe he was like 18 or something like that. Um, but, you know, his father was the king and then he was the king and, um, you know, he rules with an iron fist as an absolute dictator in the country. Um, and so how, you know, that happened with the permission of a lot of people. Um, what is the West gained from having a king in place? Um, I think that your question is a good one. Um, what happens in Swaziland? There are not a lot of natural resources. There's not a lot of geopolitical interest there. It's a tiny little country in as an enclave almost of South Africa and adjacent to Mozambique. Nobody's really looking, right? And nobody's really paying attention. So why create more trouble? That's also why South Africa plays a very hard, big role in being able to influence what goes on there. It's a country of 1.3 million people. Um, you know, so it's tiny. So it's not that there are interests in having the king in power. It's just that there's not a lot of interest in not having him in power, right? It, there, there aren't a lot of, you know, unique geopolitical considerations to that tiny little country, um, which is also why the business aspect of it, Coca-Cola's engagement there, Kellogg's engagement there, you know, could be a different kind of lever to pull um, in terms of putting pressure on the on the government there, on the king. When you were in uh, Swaziland um, to uh, to be there um, in his trial, uh, you told me a little bit about. Uh, you know, the fear that you, you guys uh, have, were having, and, um, and it gave me some uh, perspective of the situation I wanted you to share with the group that you actually had to leave your cell phone at all times because you were afraid to be hacked and to be robbed and for, for them to actually know who we were talking to. I would like you to to tell us because actually it gives us a big perspective of lack of freedom and in the oppression. So so we crossed over from South Africa and um, and we were very concerned about actually being allowed to come into the country um, because we'd been very visible in advocating for their freedom um, for Tulani and Becky and. Um, and so we had made several contingency plans of what would happen. We passed through with, to all of our surprises with no issues at all and it was fine. Um, and we went and we got to our hotel and we went to the court the next day. Um, <laughs> and one of the people who was uh, part of this delegation, Jeffrey Smith, who now is the head of Vanguard Africa, um, an organization here in Washington, um, it's a very proficient tweeter. And remember, this is in 2010. He used Twitter a lot. I was never a good tweeter and now I'm off of Twitter. But, but Jeff was really good at live tweeting all kinds of things. So the first day we go to the courthouse, fine, you know, not a big deal. The second day we get to the courthouse and they have turned off the internet for the entire courthouse basically to be able to block Jeff from tweeting and from any of us communicating with anybody outside um, through the course of the, of the trial um, or the appeal. Um, we found out um, along the way that I think on the third day, we weren't there for very long, I don't know, it was three or four days, um, but that the security services had come and visited the owner of the hotel where we were staying and said, why are you letting terrorists stay in your hotel? 
um, putting pressure on the hotel owner, obviously. Um, but we were there, not only our small delegation, but again, as I mentioned, with folks from South Africa and from other parts of the region. And so nothing terrible happened to us. We were able to bring visibility and bring pressure on the government while we were there, but then we left. And um, we, we did think for a short time um, while we were there that they were going to release them, um, but then that didn't happen. So, you know, there are lots of, there are lots of games that are played in situations like this. A lot of, of games of perception, games of politics, um, and, you know, but, but there are very real people behind all of this, right? Tulani was, was not well for a while while he was in prison. His, he was separated from his wife, from his very young son his whole family. I mean, you know, Becky also from his, his incredible wife and all of their children. Um, they're real human beings. They're not just the, the human rights defender heroes that we talk about. They're actual people. And I think that sometimes we romanticize this view of human rights defenders um, because they are very brave and they take very big risks, but they do it in the context of their own humanity with their own families and their own friends and their own community around them. And, and um, the toll that it takes is, is really quite significant. And that was definitely the case, um, you know, for Tanele and, and now for sure, um, figuring out what happens next. True. Um, there, there is a question. So do you do you happen to know uh, what is China and Russia's position? And I would extend the the question and I would say, do you know of any of the the power countries' positions, uh, you know, regarding his assassination? So I don't know, but it certainly hasn't come onto my radar that Russia or China have said anything about the assassination. The foreign minister of Russia was there the week after. He certainly didn't say anything about that. He only said that they were going to actually help to train the security forces in Swaziland. So in fact, it's quite the opposite um, of condemning the assassination. Um, you know, it's it's that you know the the king seems to be reaching out more to the russias and the chinas of the world um and the russias and the chinas of the world seem to be you know happy to do that um it's a really big problem um there's another question is the king in fear of being queued what he's doing comes for, from fear that's from marion yeah, I mean, I think that all dictators are afraid of being killed, right? Um, and that they do act with absolute power because they feel like either they're entitled to have that absolute power, it operates best for them, right? The king has a huge financial interest in being the king. The king has, I lost count, last I heard was 14 wives and many, 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 many children. Um, you know, drives around in very expensive cars, private jets, lives a very lavish life of luxury. Um, while this is one of the poorest countries in the world with the highest HIV prevalence rate, um, with one of the highest in the world. Um, and so it's kind of a recipe for disaster. You only hold on to that kind of wealth and power um, as the king of the country with, you know, pretty oppressive of uh, policies um, towards the people. And what's happening now is, you know, you, you do have a generational pressure um, and brave people who are protesting and saying, we deserve more in our country. We want to be citizens, not subjects. You hear that a lot from people in Swaziland. Um, and, you know, we, we want to have the ability to self-govern and to make decisions and to have a participatory democracy. Um, so I'm sure that the king's afraid. Um, I, you know, I, I'm sure. I'm sure some of his children probably are already 18. 
Um, you know, I, I don't know how many there are and I don't know where they are, but I'm sure that there are quite a few. And by the way, um, um, Toloni left two kids, they are very young and, um, and that uh, should matter. We have a quick question from Christy. Christy? Oh, it wasn't coming up. Um, thank you, Hadar, um, for sharing your words. Um, as you all may know, I was a part of the Humphrey Fellows Program, too, and Tulani actually attended, uh, came to Minnesota for um, one of the extended uh, workshops on peace and reconciliation. So, um, and then we had the, worked with Hadara and a lot of the, the Humphrey Fellows in terms of the 2014-15 um, work on trying to gain his release. Um, I, I was thinking, oh gosh, he must, the king must be old. And I just plugged it in and he's 54 years old. He's young. Yeah, he's not old. He was 18 when he came. And yeah. well, I was thinking 18. But you're right in 1986. Um, so I guess I'm wondering about the the region, and I've been I've texted a bit with other fellows. So aren't I don't know if Arnold Sunga was actually at the was he the, at the um, the court thing. But so there's a lot of people still working. Um, but what about the political leadership in that region? I mean, are I mean, have they, are they trying to just keep their head low and play nice with him or is, yeah, what's happening with the, I guess, within that region? Sure. So Arnold was absolutely there. Arnold Sunga, who was with the International Commission of Jurists and, and who was a Humphrey Fellow in Minnesota and who actually just sent a beautiful message. We had a memorial for Tulani last week at uh, American University. And um, I can send you the video of it. Apparently it just came up. Um, and so Arnold actually patched in um, because he and Tulani were very close friends. Um, and, um, you know, in terms of, of, of the region, that's one of the big problems, right? You have, um, there is an ability to influence this King through economics, through sanctions, through marginalizing him from the rest of the community through, you know, there are all kinds of tools available, but they're not being used. And while there was supposed to be this structured dialogue um, to actually bring parties together that was going to be led by the um, South Africans, they've kind of put it on the back burner but now the time is now to pressure them to actually re-engage um, because it's a very tenuous moment in Swaziland. Where's it going to go? Is it going to go through peaceful dialogue or is it gonna go into a much more violent posture? And I think nobody wants violence for sure, um, but maybe some people do and feel that that's the only way to go. You know, there are just a handful of, um, leaders in the region who've even, you know, they've not weighed in on this, but who may be more inclined to. Um, but it, it's very, very disappointing, very disappointing. Um, and, you know, the African Union and the various organs within Africa, um, you know, are not taking the proactive steps that you would hope that they would. Um, so, you know, they should be leading, right? The African communities and, and, you know, various other heads of state should be leading, pressing the king to treat his citizens as citizens and not subjects. Um, and to ensure that, you know, the kinds of human rights abuses that are going on against the people in Swaziland stop. Um, but there doesn't seem to be the political will to make a lot of that happening. There doesn't even seem to be the political will here to make sure that that's happening. And so it's our job 
to create that political will, to create that pressure, to, to engage with you know, the, 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 the political leaders, to put pressure on them because Swaziland is not at the top of the diplomatic agenda. It's not at the top of anybody's economic or geopolitical interests. Um, but there are over a million people there who are really suffering. And, um, you know, while it's politically difficult, it doesn't seem to be too super difficult to make changes that could benefit them. Um, but it is a question of political will. It's absolutely. Adar, we have another question. Um coming from Marion. How can we support his family and their safety team? Will they stay there? So I don't know um, if they're going to stay or what their plans are. It's still early days. You know, it's just, uh, it's not even a month yet. And so I'm sure that they're trying to figure it out. Um, they're there, there may be ways to help the family and I can send that information to Katya once we know exactly what is what it is. I don't wanna to say too much about it at this point, um, but there may be ways to engage to, to assist the family um, and, and we'll let Katya know once, once things are set up a little bit more. But one of the biggest ways that you can engage because um, again, not, the State Department doesn't get a lot of calls about Swaziland, right? Your elected leadership um, in Minnesota or, or in, in other places where you may be, don't get a lot of calls about Swaziland. And so bringing this to the attention of your elected leadership and letting them know that this is important to you as a constituent and that it needs to be important to them. And if you Google Tulani Maseko, you will see statement after statement after statement, documentation after documentation that you can use as supporting um, documents for any kind of engagement with political leaders here who could then, you know, please pressure the State Department to take a more proactive role in looking at sanctions and looking at accountability and looking at investigations and in really rethinking the way that the US government is engaging with the king in Swaziland not to hurt the people, but to make sure that there is accountability for you know, the egregious abuses that the king is perpetrating on the people. And to add what, to what you were saying, um, this, this event is being recorded and will be watched by people all over the world, including our colleagues that are Fulbright Humphrey Fellows all over the world. And, um, so the same way that we can do this here and, and contact our representatives uh, in other countries, they could also contact their own Congress people and request that uh, some, uh, some sanctions are taken or request the um, neutral and um, thorough uh, investigation in the assassination of Tulani. Um, just today, there was a joint motion for a resolution on Eswatini in the European Union. Um, so, you know, in many political bodies, this is not finished, this is not over. But I will tell you a month from now, it might be, unless there is sustained pressure from individuals and groups to make sure that um, that this isn't just brushed over and forgotten. That is the real danger in situations like this. It's not what happens in the first couple of weeks, it's what happens six months from now. Um, and that there continues to be sustained attention to what's going on. Um, I know that there are, are a variety of organizations who've committed to making sure that um, we continue to keep the pressure on um, and and continue to raise the issues, um, but if it, but the more people who do that in the more places, the better that is. And also, um, uh, we always ask in these events uh, for our guest speakers to share with us 
recommendations of actions that uh, they could suggest. So you were just giving this and you're going to follow up regarding helping the family. But if you have any other suggestions now or later, um, we would take it and we can actually post in our website as an action for people that um, are not watching today, but they will be watching the recording of this um, event. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I really do think that the first step right now is to really reach out to the, the folks who represent you um, and even directly to, to the president, to, to the State Department, to inform people that you are concerned and you are watching. You are aware of what happened and you want the U.S. government to take steps, um, all available steps, to, um, to, to, to hold the, you know, the perpetrators accountable. Um, and that can be in a variety of different ways. Again, I mean, I've said that already, but I will send you, Katya, you know, some additional ideas um, so that, um, that folks can take those steps. Yeah, the video that I shared, the, the, the video that I shared is um, on the Center for Human Rights website, um, uh, sorry, YouTube channel. But I'm trying to pull up here um, the link and I can put it in the chat if I can find it. There it is. Okay, hold on one second. It's probably going to start playing again. And then for the people that can't access right now, it's going to be on our website after this recording is uh, uploaded. You can watch again. Great. So Hadar just put in a website and I'm sure that this is going to be in our um, website um, as soon as possible. What I would also recommend um, on the website is the speech that Tulani gave at the Oslo Freedom Forum, um, which really outlines his view of change for Swaziland. It's his voice. If I had figured out how to technologically make that happen, I would have included that as well because it's really important to know who he was and to hear his messages um, directly from him. You can also see the speech that Tonelli gave on his behalf the year before. So I would encourage you to, to put those up on the website as well. Yes, I will. Do we have any other questions? I think Dick had a question in the chat, Katya. So uh, his comment is, we ordinary people like ourselves are having our own flight flirtation with authoritarianism in our own country. And we have supported it in other places quite actively on many occasions. I visited Haiti with a group in 2003 right before Aristide was deposed and our group apparently had bad friends, at least our people we met and killed uh, or otherwise isolated soon, soon after we met them. Um, and the US was not far in the background of getting rid of Aristide, the elect president. So Dick Bernard is, asks any comments? Yes, <laughs> you know, um, I'm not sure what more there is to comment about that. Yes, that is true. There is an authoritarian um, uh, wave of, or, you know, people dabbling in what, uh, the temptation, I guess is the word that I would use, temptation around authoritarianism. In, in some of our elected leaders now, and certainly in a very vocal group of um, activists who, um, who are, are condoning certain behaviors that I think are very anti-democratic. We've seen that over the last few years. And I will tell you as an international human rights attorney from 2017 on, it was very clear that the same authoritarian playbook that's in action in many countries, whether it is Poland or Hungary, 
or, or a variety of other countries was coming to the fore here in this country. It's very dangerous and people have to keep their eyes very widely open. It's complicated. That's a whole different conversation. Um, you know, I'd be happy to come back and talk about that as well. But, um, you know, the, the ways in which we can see those echoes and we can see how certain elements in our political leadership and aspiring political leadership and certain groups of people are looking to those movements, um, whether it is the Bolsonaro um, uh, regime in Brazil, um, where it seemed like there was a very symbiotic relationship right down to the storming of the presidential palace a few weeks ago in Brazil um, and, and the illegitimacy of uh, a peaceful transition of power um, or it's what Orban is doing or what's happening right now in Israel um, with a, an unconstitutional takeover of the judiciary, um, which is being legislated into fact right now. Um, so it's, it's a, a dangerous time and one that really requires all of us to be really, really, those of us who believe in human rights, those of us who believe in fundamental freedoms to be really um, engaged, not unengaged, but really more and more engaged to protect those core principles that we believe in and that help to protect not just democracy, but really thwart and ward off um, those efforts at authoritarianism that are so incredibly dangerous and that we see playing themselves out in a variety of different countries. I mean, I think it's a, it's a good way to sort of end. Um, we all have a responsibility um, and Tulani understood his responsibility to his people, to his nation and to the region. Um, I take from him every day um, and kind of channel it into the work that I'm doing now and that I've done before. Um, because as he stood up in like a legit, very oppressive regime, knowing that he was standing on principle, knowing that he as deeply held all of his convictions were, he had an easy smile and, and, and a ready laugh to, um, um, to bring people into his circle and to, you know, to, to educate about what was happening in his country and to aspire to the best for his people and, and for his nation. Um, we can't take anything for granted in this country, in the United States. Um, and I think that anybody else who lives in a, a pluralistic democracy or what is supposed to be a pluralistic democracy needs to not be taking anything for granted either. It is hard work and it requires engagement and it requires all of us to protect it. Um, and so, you know, we need to help Swaziland make change for themselves so that they can be citizens, not subjects. And we need to ensure that we as citizens in this country um, or in any of the countries where people are watching from um, stay engaged in their own society, in their own government and in their own communities to ensure that those fundamental rights, those fundamental human rights and freedoms um, are maintained, protected, and, and sometimes expanded where they need to be. I could go on and on, but I won't. That was, that was a good ending. We have, Actually, a you're very, we have a very last um, question. Sure. Um, it's uh, Marian asking your comments and she says power and greed is, are very um, active nowadays. It's a tough time to have this fight. Um, she would like to hear your comments. I, I think it's pretty much the same as what I just said. You know, it's true, but power and greed have always existed and they always will exist, right? But, um, but people have more power than we think. Um, you know, we as individuals and we collectively have tremendous power to push back on the things that are, um, are threatening basic human rights. I mean, I'm a human rights lawyer, so I speak from the frame of human rights, those fundamental rights that, um, exist by virtue of being human. Um, I think that sometimes we think that we can't do something but we all can do something. We can all do small things. We can do big things. 
Um, and when we do them together, they make even more of an impact. So, you know, the forces all seem very, very, very big and intractable and disinformation and misinformation and manipulations of elections and the U.S. behind the overthrow of elected presidents and, you know, the Russians behind the overthrow of the other elected presidents and, and the king. And it's huge. But what I always said when I was teaching is human rights attorneys are the most optimistic people in the world. And the reason is we bang our heads against the wall and then we bang our heads against the other wall. And then we go back and we bang our heads against the other wall. And victories are sometimes not very, you know, we don't have victories very often, but sometimes we do. And we believe even with all the banging of our heads that we can still change the world and we can still make it a better place. Doesn't matter what you do every day in your job. It doesn't matter, you know, how young you are, how old you are, you can make a difference. And we have to be the change because otherwise the things will change around us and, and, um, and we won't be able to respond. So, um, you know, I think that if there's anything that Tulani teaches us, it is that living your principles is incredibly important. And the, the ripples, you know, if we go back to RFK, those ripples of hope um, are incredibly important. So I, I thank you for the questions and the engagement and, and the opportunity to speak with you guys tonight, um, you, you people all tonight. Um, and I'm so happy to see some old friends and, um, I'm really grateful, Katya, that, that you made the space to have this conversation. Thank you. And we are happy that you were able to accept our invitation. Um, uh, for sure, we will have you back. We already have the request in the chat that you come back. So we make sure that you come back. Well, on behalf of CGS Minnesota, I want to thank you all for attending this event. If you want to watch again, the recording of this discussion can be found in the website, on our website, or on our YouTube channel. CGS Minnesota hosts events every month. Please check our website for updates. If you have any questions, please reach out to us at cgsmn.contact at gmail.com. On behalf of CGS Minnesota, Thank you, Hadar Harris, for your enlightening presentation. Please do keep in touch, and I know that we will. We hope that with our human rights educational projects, more people learn about human rights and help to make the world a better place. Especially, we want to have a world, world where children don't need to grow up without parents who are killed in wars, terrorism attacks, and under oppressive regimes. Here to better times. Thank you everyone uh, for coming and I hope to see you all very soon. Thank you.